Congress for 12 years. During my time in Congress, I strove to make respect for human rights a central feature in the formulation of U.S. foreign policy. Amid minor successes, I have to say that my efforts, while broadly appreciated by many, failed miserably. That failure stems in part from the peculiarities of U.S. politics that allow policy formulation to deviate from, and in many cases become diametrically opposed to, the values of the people of the U.S. Sadly, what we in the U.S. call special interests are able to buy public policy by way of campaign contributions and misle misleading media campaigns. These special interests are aided and abetted in the U.S. by a concentrated media that has no obligation, according to U.S. court de decisions, to tell the public the truth. In other words, U.S. media have won in U.S. court the right to knowingly lie to the people they ostensibly serve. I will briefly delve into this unusual and anti-democratic state of affairs now controlling in the U.S. once again before I conclude my remarks. After my tenure in Congress, I became involved in international human rights activism. During Israel's Operation Cast Lead, which was its war against Hamas and others, I joined with a group of human rights activists who tried to deliver medical supplies to the people of Gaza. The Israeli military stopped us while in international waters, an Israeli Defense Forces warship rammed the pleasure boat that I was on with the other volunteers and totally destroyed our boat. Neither the medical supplies nor us volunteers reached Gaza. Approximately six months later, we, the volunteers from the first thwarted effort, reassembled in order to make another attempt to reach Gaza by sea, traveling through international waters with the hopes of entering into Palestine by way of Gaza's territorial waters. By this time, Operation Cast Lead had ended. President Barack Obama had been sworn in, and he had appealed publicly for an easing of the Israeli blockade of Gaza. Gazans had made an appeal for school supplies for the children still reeling from the trauma of three weeks of what the United Nations called, quote, one of the most violent episodes in the recent history of the Palestinian territory. So some of us answered that call with school supplies for the children and building supplies for the adults so that Gaza could rebuild from the devastation after Operation Cast Lead. On this effort, to answer a humanitarian call for help, I, along with 20 other volunteers, was kidnapped by the Israeli military while in international waters. Our boat was seized. We were taken by an extremely circuitous route to Israel, where we never <coughs> intended to go, and I was incarcerated in an Israeli prison for seven days. Sadly, what I witnessed while in Israeli prison pointed to Israel as an apartheid state and the gross mistreatment of particularly Ethiopian women who have been lured to the Holy Land for job opportunities that vaporized because they were not of the correct religion. In addition to that, my observation at the time was that Ethiopian Jews are used as an important pillar, even enforcer, ironically, of Israeli apartheid. I can expand on this aspect of my observations later if there are specific questions or requests for more information from this body or from individuals in attendance at this conference. 
Needless to say, for a second time, I was prevented from entering Gaza. Upon hearing of my ordeal, Member of Parliament George Galloway, who was in Cairo leading Viva Palestina USA, contacted me and invited me to come to Cairo and enter Gaza by land, which I did. Upon entering Gaza, I was able to see the destruction inflicted on the people by Israel's Operation Cast Lead. I scooped up a bit of soil and put it in this container. Sadly, as noted in the Goldstone Report and admitted by the Israeli Defense Forces, this Gaza soil is probably contaminated with whatever remains of the chemicals that were used by the Israelis against the people of Gaza. Chemicals ranging from white phosphorus to inert metals. And while I unsuccessfully tried to pass legislation in Congress to end the use of depleted uranium in U.S. munitions because of the health effects, the Goldstone Report mentions that allegations were made that Israel used depleted uranium during Operation Cast Lead, which also might be in this soil. The United Nations Division for Palestinian Rights is also aware that civilian targets were bombed and totally destroyed. I visited a few of those targets. One stop on my private tour of this destruction in Gaza was the American International School. And amid the rubble, I spotted a bright yellow something that I couldn't quite make out what it was. So I climbed through the jutted shards of concrete and exposed rebar to retrieve the object. It was this children's art book stamped with the initials of the American International School in Gaza. Also, I was standing in what was left of the school's library. Another stop on my tour of the effects of Israel's Operation Cast Lead was a neighborhood school, not nearly as big and grand as the American school. There I could see the path of one missile that blew a hole clear through several walls of the school. There were markings on the chalkboard, including the Star of David. I saw several cans of peanuts on the floor. This is one of them. It is written in Hebrew. The Israeli soldiers blew up the school and then sat down in its ruins and enjoyed a can of peanuts while they drew religious and political markings on the chalkboard. Both boats that I was on were seized by the Israelis and destroyed by them. The humanitarian aid on the boats did not reach Gaza and only token aid was delivered by the land convoy to the Al Shifa hospital in Gaza. The bulk of it stranded in Egypt, not allowed into Gaza by the Egyptians or the Israelis. What is amazing is not only that this happens over and over again, but that Israeli leaders who commit war crimes and crimes against humanity leave office and are never held accountable for their policies, as was done by the victims of, of Augusto Pinochet, and is, as is being done currently by the International Criminal Court. Another aspect of this impunity is that Israel continues to receive US weapons and technology, which it uses against civilians in contravention of US law. As these weapons are used or become outdated, the U.S. replenishes Israel's weapons stock every year. One measure of this impunity is brought to bear by the pro-Israel lobby that operates in the political sphere of the U.S. I am a former member of Congress because pro-Israel sympathizers, known as the pro-Israel lobby, 
ensured my ouster from Congress and that of many other members of Congress who dared to try and draw attention to U.S. law, Israel's human rights violations, Israel's misuse of U.S. weapons, or any other inconvenient facts that were better buried and left unknown. What many of you might not know, because these things just aren't discussed as widely as they should be, is that many of those members of Congress who were put out of office by the pro-Israel lobby were the stolen children of Africa, descendants of Africans trafficked in the transatlantic slave trade. I will call the names of a few and tell you where you can find information about them as they tell their own stories. Gus Savage, member of Congress from Chicago, Illinois, was targeted for defeat by the pro-Israel lobby because he dared to engage in foreign relations within the purview of a member of Congress on the African continent in Egypt, among other places. He recounted his ordeal on the floor of the House of Representatives and revealed the secrets of the pro-Israel lobby on the congressional record where students and others interested in this topic can find his words today. Earl Hilliard, member of Congress from Birmingham, Alabama, was the first black member of Congress to serve the people of Alabama since the U.S. Civil War's Reconstruction era. He was ejected from the Congress by the pro-Israel lobby because he, like Gus Savage, traveled to Africa, and in particular, to Libya. He also traveled to Lebanon and learned of new weapons for that time that had been used there by Israel. For this transgression, Earl Hilliard had to go. He is interviewed in a Dutch documentary that is available on YouTube. He describes the vicious campaign that was run against him by the pro-Israel lobby. And then there's me. Just this month, I published a book entitled Ain't Nothing Like Freedom, in which I describe just a few of the tactics that were used against me by the pro-Israel lobby to destroy my career in Congress. These three political takedowns were very publicly done in order to send a message to others who also might be inclined to speak up out of moral conviction as Savage Hilliard and I did. This weeding out also occurs on the local level with state and local elected officials like my father and others targeted for defeat because of the potential threat to the interests of the pro-Israel lobby that they pose. In addition, on a public and private level, targeted individuals have to endure soft repression that makes life difficult. All of this needs to be put on the record if one is to fully understand the power of the pro-Israel lobby and the pall that it casts on the political process in the U.S. and from what I have been told also in Europe. Finally, the political landscape for blacks in the U.S. is negatively affected by this weeding out process because the strongest and most outspoken authentic leaders are vulnerable to challenges from candidates that are well-funded by outside special interests. In light of this, I would like to put this thought to you. Can you even imagine what U.S. policy would be like at the United Nations if the will of the people were carried out without the interference of the pro-Israel lobby? The Durban World Conference Against Racism was a watershed that could be revisited time and time again with U.S. support and participation, except that powerful lobbies want otherwise. I know it's hard to imagine things differently, but it is not hard for me, and that is one vision that keeps me going. U.S. policy made in the image of the values of the people of the U.S., at a conference whose theme 
is African solidarity with the Palestinian people. I thought it was important to mention not only how the pro-Israel lobby skews politics in the U.S. against the Palestinians, but also against African descendants inside the U.S. I focus on this important aspect of policy making by focusing on who gets to make the policy. Because I believe that this is one key reason why Palestinians are forced to suffer, while at best platitudes and delay serve as the effective policies of the US and European countries. The short version of this tragic story is that pro-Israel forces inside the US are willing to use their money to buy political influence and protection for Israel across the political spectrum, while the same cannot be said of pro-peace, pro-justice forces. I liken the situation to game day. When one team shows up in beautiful new uniforms with all of the latest and best equipment, primed and ready to execute its strategy in the game of play, while the other team doesn't even show up. I believe that one remaining untested justice frontier is the political battleground in the US and European capitals. It is inside these essential capitals that pro-Israel lobbies have become comfortable and in operating with very little opposition from the other side. I'm tired of losing when I believe we really don't have to lose. I fundamentally believe that the people of this world are good and want peace. I have spoken to Afghanis and Pakistanis, to Yemenis and to Somalis, Palestinians and Americans, and I find them to be peace-loving peoples. So how do we move from where we are to where we need to be? That is the fundamental question. I focus on the political because the political creates the legal and the political creates impunity. Just in my personal experiences, I have outlined breaches of international humanitarian law, international human rights law, international law, and even US law by the occupying power Israel. I served as a juror on the Bertrand Russell Tribunal on Palestine that recently concluded its session with a finding that both the US and Europe are guilty of contributing to the atmosphere of impunity with which apartheid Israel carries out its policies against Palestinians and anyone who stands in its way. I also recently served as an official observer at the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Commission as it received testimony from Palestinians on their treatment inside Israel as well as in the occupied territories. Through my service with both of these organizations, I have met too many courageous Palestinians and Israelis who want to live peacefully with each other and who put their lives and their livelihoods on the line every day for peace and the rule of law. I believe that much of the suffering could be alleviated if we would put sufficient energy and resources behind putting out in public view how the pro-Israel lobby misdirects US and European policies and prevents pro-peace and pro-justice politicians from ever having the opportunity to put those values along with our basic human dignity permanently on the table for public debate. Finally, I'm not Palestinian, I'm not Arab, I'm not Muslim, but I am human. And that is enough for me to acknowledge the dignity of others who are oppressed and to epitomize what this conference is all about. African solidarity with the Palestinian people for the achievement of its inalienable rights, including the sovereignty and independence of the state of Palestine. Thank you.